Each year, more than 800,000 people flock to visit the Washington Monument. The massive stone edifice towers over Washington, D.C., the city which shares its namesake. At its completion, it was the tallest man-made structure in the world, standing at just over 555 feet. The literal new heights reached by the monument were meant to commemorate the works of American founding father and president, George Washington. Its architecture evokes a sense of grandeur, hearkening to the glory of civilization's past and carving out a space in history for the American nation among them. The question, however, still remains as to why a monument dedicated to such an iconically American figure is shaped like an Egyptian obelisk. The ancient Egyptians built obelisks as religious monuments, usually dedicated to various solar divinities, including Atum and Ra. This particular dedication gives rise to the name by which the Egyptians referred to these monuments, Tekenu, meaning sunbeam. The word obelisk is a foreign descriptor, coming from the diminutive of the Greek word obelos, meaning spit or rod. The historian Herodotus was the first to use the word to describe these Egyptian monuments in the 5th century BCE, though evidence suggests Egyptians were constructing the monuments as early as the 5th and 6th dynasties of the Old Kingdom. In addition to fulfilling a religious purpose, these monuments also served as powerful vehicles for conveying the earthly might of the pharaohs who commissioned them. The process of quarrying, transporting, and erecting an obelisk approached the very limit of what was humanly possible at the time, reinforcing the authority of the rulers who were able to command such a task. In this duality of function, obelisks became monumental intermediaries between the spheres of the earthly and the divine. The uppermost part of the obelisk, called the Pyramidion, would have been plated in gold or electrum to capture the sun's rays and reflect them back to earth, enabling the interaction between what was then the pinnacle of human invention and the life-giving power of the sun. Obelisks not only communicated the relationship between religion and kingship materially, but also textually, typically inscribed with hieroglyphs. Hieroglyphic script is the oldest form of Egyptian writing and was usually restricted in its usage for religious and funerary monuments. This fully developed and complex writing system made use of phonetic as well as ideographic characters. Some glyphs represented the objects they depicted. For instance, this character, depicting a human head, represents the Egyptian word for head. Most words, however, weren't written this way, but rather by combining various characters representing distinct sounds, much like we do with letters in our alphabet. Hieroglyphic writing also made use of what are called determinatives, signs that were placed at the end of words to identify what particular grouping of words it belonged to. Hieroglyphic inscriptions typically paid tribute to the appropriate deities, but also commemorated the pharaoh who commissioned the monument. Ray shines forth, rejoicing over them in his house of millions of years. It is his majesty who has completed this monument for his father, so that his name might be granted to aid in the house of Ray, made for him by the son of Ray, Ramses II, the beloved of Atum, lord of Heliopolis, and given life forever. Sometimes the inscriptions reference specific aspects of the obelisk's construction. The inscription on the base of Hatshepsut's Karnak obelisks tells us with a sense of wonder how the pair of monuments were quarried each from a single stone without any seams. Egyptian obelisks were monolithic in nature, quarried from a single stone. We still don't fully understand how the ancient Egyptians accomplished such a demanding task, but the study of an unfinished obelisk in Aswan, abandoned in its quarry after cracks formed in the granite during construction, has granted us invaluable insight into this unquestionably labor-intensive and complex process. First, the shape of the obelisk had to be marked out on the surface of the granite. It was imperative that the sides were straight and even, and the slope of the incline was meticulously calculated. Fires were then lit on top of the stone to heat the surface, which was then quickly cooled by water poured over top of it. This drastic change in temperature caused the surface to crack allowing workers to smooth the surface after removing loose stones. For most of the time that Egyptians were creating obelisks, iron tools weren't available to dig out the trenches to create the sides of the monument. Instead, they used balls of dolerite, an extremely hard stone found in the eastern desert of Egypt, 
to literally bash out the stone to separate the obelisk from the bedrock. Hundreds of workers would have been required on site for this step in the process alone. We know less about how obelisks were transported in Egypt once they had been quarried. Various reliefs on tombs and temples suggest the usage of sledges, rollers, ropes, and levers, along with massive amounts of manpower. One papyrus document, dating to the reign of Ramses IV, records that over 8,000 men were necessary to move a single obelisk, the majority of whom were enslaved. After being hauled from the quarry to the edge of the Nile, the obelisks were floated down the river to their final destinations, where they needed to be raised up onto their pedestals. There have been various hypotheses proposed as to how exactly the Egyptians accomplished this, but it's likely in the 2000 year span in which Egyptians were raising obelisks that a variety of methods were used. Of the hundreds of obelisks that once towered over Egypt, only nine still stand. Many were broken or destroyed over the millennia, some, we presume, lie buried in the sand, awaiting excavation. Yet others still were carried away by foreign powers as souvenirs of an imperial conquest. Egypt, which had been ruled over by the Ptolemies for nearly 300 years, was no stranger to foreign governance when it became a Roman province in 30 BCE. In the final war of the Roman Republic, Cleopatra allied her nation with her husband Mark Antony against Octavian, adopted son and heir of Julius Caesar. In the Battle of Actium, Octavian defeated the naval forces of Antony and Cleopatra, leading the couple to commit suicide. This victory not only helped Octavian consolidate his power in Rome, but also to gain control of Egypt, one of the first territorial expansions he would make as Augustus, Rome's first emperor. In a display of his triumph and conquest over the foreign nation, Augustus removed several obelisks from Egypt transporting them across the Mediterranean to be re-erected in Rome. The first to reach its new placement was the obelisk of Seti I and Ramses II, which was set up on the spina of the Circus Maximus, the long brick barrier that ran down the center of the race course. Pliny the Elder writes that the ship required to transport the 78 and a half foot obelisk was so incredible itself that the emperor consecrated it as a monument to the marvelous undertaking, and it was put on display at a dock in Pozzuoli until it was later destroyed by a fire. A second, slightly smaller obelisk, originally erected by Semeticus II, was placed in the Campus Martius. This monument had an added practical purpose. It was positioned in the center of a massive calendrical instrument known as a meridian, measuring the sun's noontime shadow against the pavement. The new bases for the monuments were inscribed identically in Latin, proclaiming Imperator Augustus, son of the divine Caesar and Pontifex Maximus, Imperator twelve times, Consul eleven times, and Tribune of the people fourteen times, dedicated this gift to the sun after Egypt had been brought under the rule of the Roman people. This inscription speaks to the might of the Roman state and its subjugation of Egypt, but interestingly, still retains the original solar dedication, so central to the obelisk's original purpose. Nevertheless, it's important to recognize that in Rome, these monuments were appropriated to honor the solar gods as the Romans understood them, not as the Egyptians did. It's safe to say that even the most educated and elite Romans couldn't read or understand the original hieroglyphic inscriptions. By claiming these monuments as their own, the Romans transformed them from symbols of one imperial and religious power to another. Augustus started a rather fashionable trend. By the middle of the fourth century, nearly 50 obelisks decorated the Roman skyline. Even today, there are more Egyptian obelisks in Rome than in Egypt. Three centuries after Egypt had become a Roman province, the Emperor Constantine planned to import an obelisk to adorn his new capital in the east, but died before its journey. Instead, his son and successor Constantius erected the obelisk in the Circus Maximus, next to the one Augustus had placed there hundreds of years before. As far as we know, this was the last obelisk brought to Rome. With the rise of Christianity, these pagan monuments fell out of fashion and into ruin, along with much of Rome's ancient landscape. That is, until the reign of Pope Sixtus V, beginning in 1585. Of all the popes to revive the neglected obelisks, Sixtus seems a particularly peculiar candidate. No lover of antiquity, 
the swineherd who grew up to ascend the papal throne, viewed Rome's ancient ruins as festering sores of an ugly pagan civilization. His plan to demolish the Colosseum was only narrowly avoided by his death, possibly at the hands of Jesuit poisoners. A strict moralist, he brutalized heretics and believers alike, burning holes in the tongues of blasphemers, ripping out the guts and quartering the limbs of bandits, and burning men alive who were suspected of homosexual behavior, along with at least one baker who he deemed to be producing inferior bread. He funded extravagant spending through heavy taxation and selling church offices. It was often remarked that the only thing left for him to impose a tax on was the heat of the sun. A large portion of this spending went to a massive rebuilding project, which included resurrecting several obelisks, rebranding them as symbols of the church's power and triumph over pagan religions, to quench the detestable memories of idolatry and exalt the mysteries of the Catholic religion. The first obelisk instrumental to his plan was the Vatican obelisk, the only one of its kind to survive upright and intact throughout the Middle Ages, perhaps because of the popularly held belief that the obelisk had witnessed the martyrdom of St. Peter. As such, it was decided that St. Peter's Square, rather than the ruins of the Circus of Nero, would be a more suitable location for such a relic. Sixtus set up a committee of mathematicians, architects, and engineers to oversee proposals for the project. In less than a month, over 500 men came before the committee to pitch their ideas on how best to move the over 300-ton monolith. Some arrived with drawings, some with scale models, various inventions, others still hoped to sway the committee with verbal descriptions of their plans. Ultimately, the bid went to architect Domenico Fontana, who proposed constructing a massive timber framework he called the Castello, supporting a complex system of pulley blocks, tackle, and ropes to raise the obelisk before lowering it onto its side. It would then be pulled along a ramp to its new location, where the Castello would be reconstructed to lift the obelisk back up and onto its new pedestal. The Pope granted Fontana a special edict of authority, allowing him to tear down any private residences that stood in his way. Any person that interfered with operations could face punishment of death. It took Fontana and his team of nearly a thousand men 13 months to move the obelisk. They worked all through the summer heat, only suspending operations when the fear that the ropes would catch fire became a serious threat. When at long last the monument reached its new site on September 10th, 1586, it was fitted with a golden cross at its summit and purged of its pagan past through an actual exorcism. It was doused in holy water and the presiding bishop proclaimed, I exorcise you, creature of stone, in the name of God, the omnipotent father, in the name of Jesus Christ, his son, and in the virtue of the Holy Spirit, that you may be an exorcised stone. Its transformation into an effigy of the Catholic Church's suppression of paganism was completed with new inscriptions added to its base, carved in a specially designed Christian font, which Sixtus used in many other of his commemorative texts. The inscription details how Sixtus purified the obelisk from the impious cult of the pagan gods and consecrated it more justly and appropriately to the invincible cross. Just as with the ancient Roman appropriation of obelisks, this rededication emphasizes the conquest and supremacy over the very culture which originated the monument, this time under the banner of Christ in the Catholic Church. Not everyone was happy about the new life given to the obelisk, with many mockingly referring to it as St. Peter's Prick. The public's implication of some sort of Freudian complex did not, however, stop Sixtus from re-erecting three more obelisks throughout the city, remodeling what had been prominent symbols of Rome's imperial power into embodiments of Christianity's suppression over paganism and the papal inheritance of Rome's glorious imperium. Not to be outdone by their predecessor, many following popes attempted to tie their name to the resurrection and rededication of other obelisks, some more successfully than others. In 1649, Pope Innocent X assigned Jesuit polymath Athanasius Kircher to supervise the excavation and restoration of the broken obelisk of Domitian in the Circus Maxentius. Kircher, who was fully convinced in his ability to read hieroglyphs, erroneously interpreted the obelisk's inscription to be a message about the life-giving forces of nature. 
Going off this interpretation, John Lorenzo Bernini designed a grand fountain complex to serve as the monument's base in the Piazza Navona, evoking the powers and harmony of nature by featuring the personifications of the four great rivers of the world, the Nile, the Ganges, the Danube, and the Plate. Kircher and Bernini worked together again under Alexander VII after an obelisk was discovered buried in the gardens of the Dominican convent at Santa Maria Sopra Minerva in 1665. This time, the obelisk was placed on the back of a stone elephant. In Kircher's mind, the animal was the perfect metaphor for the robust mind needed to carry the wisdom encoded in the hieroglyphs. As a Jesuit, Kircher also took the opportunity to slight his order's rivals, the Dominicans, by facing the elephant directly towards the Dominican convent, with its trunk mimicking a particular hand gesture. Over the course of the 17th and 18th centuries, most of the city's surviving obelisks had been resurrected. In 1711, Clement XI installed an obelisk commissioned by Ramses II on a fountain in front of the Pantheon. Pius VI followed suit in 1786, raising the second of the two obelisks from the Mausoleum of Augustus in the Piazza Quirinale in front of the Pope's summer home, flanked by two giant sculptures of the Dioscuri. He also raised the Celestian Obelisk, a smaller Roman-era copy of the Great Obelisk in the Piazza del Popolo at the Trinità dei Monti, overlooking the Spanish Steps. His successor, Pius VII, was responsible for setting up the small 30-foot obelisk which the Emperor Hadrian had constructed in the memory of his lover Antinous in a public park at the top of the Pincian Hill. Around the same time, Egyptian artifacts came onto the world stage in an entirely new light, thanks to one, Napoleon Bonaparte. Following a succession of victories in Europe, Napoleon set his sights on invading Egypt. This was a highly strategic move as it would block Britain from being able to access trade routes to India. Napoleon greatly admired previous conquerors of Egypt, including Alexander the Great and Caesar, and was eager to place himself among their ranks. Military conquest, however, wasn't the only thing on the leader's mind when he set foot on Egyptian soil in 1798. Along with his troops, Napoleon brought some 150 scientists, engineers, and artists to conduct experiments and collect artifacts. Within a month of landing, the engineers had cleared away the sand from a fallen obelisk at Alexandria. France, the newest inheritor of Rome's imperial mantle, was eager to take its own obelisk but was prevented by the British Royal Navy, which destroyed the majority of the French fleet. Following this setback, Napoleon returned to France, leaving behind his army and group of savants, who had continued to fight and research until suing for peace in 1801, finally able to return home on British ships. While the invasion was a catastrophic disaster from a militaristic standpoint, it was revolutionary in two key ways. First off, it disrupted the Egyptian political landscape, allowing Albanian Ottoman governor Muhammad Ali to come to power. His reign was marked by the desire to modernize Egypt, implementing a series of industrial, economic, political, and cultural reforms. He sought to maintain close ties with Europe, leading once again to the exportation of Egyptian monuments to foreign nations. He gifted Europe and the US three monuments, which can today be found in London, Paris, and New York. The work of Napoleon scholars also launched the formal field of Egyptology and drummed up intense public interest in ancient Egypt abroad, particularly after the publication of the 29-volume Description de l'Egypte and the deciphering of the Rosetta Stone. Now housed in the British Museum, the Rosetta Stone features a trilingual inscription, informal hieroglyphics, demotic script, and ancient Greek. While the ancient Egyptian language was a mystery to scholars, Greek was not. This meant they could compare the inscriptions to learn how the language worked. This set off an arms race between the British and the French, both eager to be the first to crack the code. The French found their champion in Jean-Francois Champollion. Champollion had been a child prodigy in philology, mastering several ancient languages and presenting his papers at universities by his mid-teens. His intense reverence and dedication to his research sometimes rubbed people the wrong way. A landlady once kicked him out, thinking he was a raving lunatic, after overhearing him practice speaking Coptic to himself. It was ultimately, however, his dedication which allowed him to succeed where others failed. He dismissed the earlier work of Kircher entirely, 
starting from the ground up. Counting the number of Greek words and hieroglyphic characters, he realized there were three times as many glyphs. This led him to the conclusion that at least some of the hieroglyphic characters had to be representing sounds instead of words. He identified the name Ptolemy on the Rosetta Stone by comparing the Egyptian text with the Greek. He was able to cross-reference this with an inscription found on an obelisk wealthy antiquarian William Banks had brought back to England, where he also found the name Cleopatra. He was able to identify her name since it shared several phonetic characters with the name Ptolemy. He applied his system to as many inscriptions as he could get his hands on, most from obelisks, identifying many more Greek and Roman names. Soon, he had the alphabetical equivalent of 24 Egyptian glyphs, which he combined with his intimate knowledge of Coptic to decipher more and more text, opening up a whole world of knowledge which had been previously inaccessible. As scholars like Champollion published their work and artifacts circulated through museums, fascination with ancient Egypt exploded across Europe and America in a phenomenon known as Egyptomania. This fascination permeated literature, art, architecture, and politics at a time when Americans were grappling for a sense of national identity. A relatively new nation, America faced criticism from abroad for a perceived lack of culture and refinement thought to be endowed by a meaningful past. As such, the American elite sought to craft a national heritage for themselves. Working with what they saw as virtually a blank slate, they positioned themselves as the cultural descendants in a long lineage of great civilizations, with Egypt as the original parent nation. This constructed genealogy can be viewed in a mural on the rotunda of the Library of Congress, entitled The Evolution of Civilization. On its surface, this type of ideology seems to be paying homage to the contributions of civilization's past, but it also subtly communicates a sense of cultural superiority, with American society being the most evolved, drawing upon only the best qualities of its predecessors, contributing to an idealized sense of self. When using Egyptian motifs in commemorative architecture, Americans had more than just their usage in the original Egyptian context to draw upon. The Roman and papal legacies of appropriating Egyptian images in association with dominance and expansion was particularly appealing to Americans, especially given the newly acquired territory from the Louisiana Purchase and the nation's growing desire to establish itself as an imperial power. This can be seen in many of the design proposals for the Washington Monument. While plans to erect a national monument for the Founding Father dated as far back as 1783, it wasn't until 1836 that the Washington National Monument Society had collected enough funds to start accepting proposals. The Society reviewed submissions, which included an odd vaulted pyramid with a smaller pyramid inside, a Roman-style equestrian statue and triumphal arch infused with Gothic elements, and a structure reminiscent of the Column of Trajan positioned on top of a Greco-Roman style temple. The winning design came from Robert Mills, featuring a nearly 600 foot tall obelisk surrounded by a Roman circular temple decorated with Greek Doric columns. On top of the rotunda, there would be a massive statue of George Washington in a chariot led by six horses. Within this eclectic style, the obelisk speaks less to its Egyptian origins and more to Rome's imperial power, with George Washington taking on the guise of a Roman emperor. Construction began in 1848, celebrating the laying of the cornerstone with the ceremony on the 4th of July. Unlike an ancient obelisk, the central piece of the monument wasn't intended to be monolithic, but rather built up stone by stone. Then Speaker of the House, Robert C. Winthrop, delivered a dedicatory speech proclaiming that the stone pillar about to be built should at once be a pledge and an emblem of perpetual union. This hope was unfortunately short-lived. When the obelisk had reached a height of 156 feet in 1854, construction came to a halt due to vandalism from the Know Nothing Party. The deeply anti-Catholic and anti-immigrant nationalist party objected to the monument on the grounds that Pope Pius IX had gifted a three-foot slab of marble from the Temple of Concord in Rome for its construction. The Know Nothings broke into the shed containing the quarried stones to be placed on the monument and destroyed what had been nicknamed the Pope's Stone. 
This alienated American Catholics from supporting the project. To make matters worse, the Know Nothings took over the Monument Society and started only collecting donations for the project from those they deemed true Americans. Turns out their prejudice proved financially inadvisable as over the course of three years, they were only able to collect $51.66 in funding. By the beginning of the Civil War, the stump of an obelisk was a national embarrassment. The unfinished monument was a particularly sore spot for many Americans, since any hope of its completion was tied up with the preservation of the warring nation. Even after the war, construction didn't resume, with the press touting the project as a catastrophic failure. Ultimately, it wouldn't be until the National Centennial in 1876, when Congress stepped in, that any progress would actually be made. They appointed Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Lincoln Casey of the Army Corps of Engineers to oversee the project. Casey scrapped Mills's original idea for a rotunda and equestrian statue, instead focusing on just completing the long-abandoned obelisk. Using a steam-powered elevator positioned in the center of the hollow monument, the Masons lifted slabs of marble up to their positions on the exterior, working their way up stone by stone. In 1884, nearly four decades after the cornerstone had been laid, the monument was finally completed. Once a great source of shame for the nation, the record-breaking monument stood over the Capitol, instilling pride in the hearts of Americans. The New York Times described the obelisk as characteristically American, citing the fact that it was taller than any other man-made monument as something that was particularly pleasing to the patriotic mind. Today, the Washington Monument is as much a part of the American identity as apple pie or baseball. But what exactly does that say about us? There's something almost hauntological about the structure, mimicking the form of an Egyptian obelisk, but vastly different in its construction. Rather than being quarried from a single stone, it's pieced together from thousands of smaller slabs, a tangible embodiment of the motto, e pluribus unum, one from many. You also won't find any hieroglyphic text on the monument. Rather, following in the footsteps of the Romans, it's inscribed in Latin. The inscription on the capstone reads simply, Laus Deo, glory to God, an echo of the texts with which obelisks were rededicated to the Christian God under the papacy. The Washington Monument is not an Egyptian obelisk. It was never ripped away from its original context and shipped across the ocean to a foreign land, as was the fate of many Egyptian obelisks, along with countless other artifacts. The U.S. didn't have a physical imperial presence in Egypt, but by appropriating the monumental architecture, we did participate in a type of cultural imperialism. As was evident in Mills's original design proposal, the monument wasn't intended to just evoke a connection to Egypt, but also to the civilizations that invaded, conquered, and suppressed the nation. Early 19th century Americans may have believed it was possible to craft a national identity based on past civilizations, adopting all the best qualities of their predecessors while ignoring their faults. If we are to truly lay claim to the legacy of the past, we need to be willing to confront both the good and the bad. Hopefully then, we can learn from the mistakes of those who came before and focus on creating the type of society future generations will be proud to memorialize.